Very cool. Okay, and then I'm going to introduce Pete. And so Pete comes to us from A Commence Advisors, hence why I was saying A Commence earlier, because we will commence this thing. Uh, Pete has, is IoT extraordinaire. He is very much a mentor and advisor even to me personally, and so much so that like he's led everything from big business all the way to small startups and has even broken the way in a lot of the industry we know now. So, yeah. Good make you cry. Well, thanks. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Pete Tadeghi. Um, so, you know, I, I came to the revelation um, uh, the other day that in 2016 will be my 35th year in communications, mobile, and IoT. So, uh, so I'm. Uh, which means that um, I will continue to have the debate with Mary. But, <laughs> so uh, I've been doing this a long time. Um, I haven't been in IoT for 35 years, but uh, I've been in IoT now since uh, 2002. So and all precursors prior to that. Okay, so let's start grilling. I think this is what we're here for. Uh, so I may or may not follow my script, so I'm not entirely following everything. But, um, you know, since we're starting with the, the intros and things, what is something that people cannot find online about you? Because we already know we can find them on LinkedIn and everything else, so what's the one thing that people can't find on, online about you? So when I got out of high school in college, me and my buddy, uh, we, and we played baseball and whatnot, um, we worked with another gentleman and we coached our local girls softball team to the Pennsylvania State Fast Pitch. Oh, that's Jackson. awesome. Wait, fast pitch or slow pitch? Fast pitch. Ooh. Wow. So we had one pitcher that was windmill and the other one was slingshot. <laughs> that sounds like fun. They don't do slingshot anymore, I don't believe. Okay. Since there's that, then how did you get started? So this is a question from the audience we got asked earlier. How did you get started in IoT specifically, and what would you recommend for people to get started in IoT? So I was working for a company uh, called Electronic Data Systems, and I was in their communications practice working for a gentleman named Dennis Stolke. Um, and we had a project, he just was just coming off leadership of our General Motors client and moving into the communications sector. And we had a, uh, a couple of projects where General Motors wanted to um, enable some technology. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do is build a communication system for automobiles. Um, and of course that later uh, iterated into a, a service called OnStar. Uh, another thing that they wanted to do, and this is a project that was more closely associated to, they had a problem. They had a, a multitude of plants throughout the United States where um, they were losing a car a week out of each of the plants, like 20 of them. It's a pretty expensive problem. So we ended up putting sensors, uh, RFID tags on all the cars, and then sensors throughout the ingresses and egresses uh, to track the, uh, you know, the, uh, the puts and the takes of the cars. And then we ultimately found out where the cars were going and insult them it solved the multi-million dollar year problem with General Motors. Where do you lose cars out of uh, a factory line? Theft. That's interesting. Employee that, theft. That makes sense. It's, it's to get Johnny Cash on, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so how would you recommend these guys start today then? So, I was just answering that question before we started. So. You know, uh, IoT is very, um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very iterative process, right? Um, you know, there are lots of components, and every place in the IoT value chain is a starting point. So sensors are a place to start. Data collection is a place to start. Platform technology is a place to start. Um, you know, structured and unstructured data, SQL and NoSQL data, Hadoop, Cassandra, place to start. Um, analytics and visualizations engines, place to start. You know, uh, workflow uh, BPM engines, 
place to start because at the end of the day, all of them add to uh, to the value. So John, you're going to hate what I'm going to say. IoT is less about the sensor and more about the workflow. So any place in the workflow is a great place to be. The sensors are mandatory. IoT doesn't work without the sensors. But IoT also doesn't work without any of the other components. And I believe that's really the difference between IoT and MTAB. Okay, so since you just said a slew of different areas in an ecosystem, basically, we're talking about a giant ecosystem. Um, there are 50 billion devices, or at least that's what they say. So where are all these devices, and what, where, what are they doing? Well, so that's a great question. So most of the common periodicals, you know, talk about the growth of, of you know, two 50 billion devices. You know, um, if you if you read Cisco's literature, um, they're talking about 50 billion devices to 2020. Um, you know, it, I, I just saw a, a you know some of the some of the statistics. Um, the devices, you know, that are being manufactured now have, have blood throat sensors. I mean, case in point. So let's say you take a Samsung uh, uh, a, a GS6 Plus, okay, Galaxy S6 Plus. Um, there are 23 sensors in the phone. There are 23 sensors in the phone. Okay. Now you don't think about it that way. You think about it as in the in the realm of Internet of Things. You think of it as a thing. So I mean, if you look at a, a car, I mean, how many compute systems are in a car at this point? You know, there's over 11. So, and how many sensors are enabled there? I mean, so you don't think about how many sensors are built into things, but the sensors reside there. Are there 50 billion sensors out there today? No. Will there be 50 billion sensors out in 2020? I don't know. But but it's going to be big. It's going to be big. Trust us. Yeah, and that kind of brings up another conversation I know we had the other day, which was not just the car, right? And we're collecting all this data. Um, what we were talking about, a jet engine, just a generic jet engine, collects a flight from New York to LA. It was collecting, what, four terabytes of data? Right. What do you do with all of that data? That's a great question. So the good news is, um, you know, the people at EMC or, or, or you know, the people, you know, you know people who manufacture hard, hard disks, right, like Samsung, Samsung just uh, announced a, a 16 terabyte solid state drive, right? So they're all chomping at the bit for this, right? However, from a reality perspective, it's not about the data that you collect, it's about the data that you analyze, and the data that you store, and the data that you forward. So case in point, take that jet aircraft engine, let's take a component of that engine. So you're looking at hydraulic, uh, the, uh, the hydraulic line pressure. If you look at hydraulic line pre pressure in an air airplane engine, you're looking to measure the variances as opposed to the steady state. So over a six hour flight across the United States, if, if, if the pressure remains constant and you're taking 15 second snapshots off that particular sensor, do you really need to report every 15 seconds what the, what the, the, uh, the data was? No, what you need to do is you know, provide a report saying steady state throughout the entire flight, maybe you know, report the anomalies, which is why edge computing is going to be so powerful as well in IoT platforms. So okay, so this is kind of interesting, right? Um, now we're talking about before everything was cloud, 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 cloud. And with IoT, it's it's sort of, it has to be connected to the cloud, right? M to M is, is one part of it, and then the cloud is what makes IoT IoT. But you're now going back to edge computing, right? And so does that take it make it not IoT and go back to M to M? Oh, it's great. So that, 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 that's a great analogy. So the answer is um, edge computing is a thing, right? The, the, the principal difference between M to M and IoT, at least in my mind's eye, and, and the debates out there, there are no right or wrong answers, is, um, is the ability to go and utilize and massage the data. 
in classic old M2M systems. Okay, they were closed loop. Data wasn't available um, to uh, anything but a, a closed control room, and there were no structured or unstructured data. You know, couple buildings. I mean, case in point, I used to work for a company called Samsung here, which brought me from Philadelphia to Texas. And um, in 2009, I worked on the team. We built a Coke machine for a company in Atlanta. Oh yeah, Coke. And um, you know, and it had you know a 3D uh, a 3D mod, you know module from Verizon in it. It was a telep module. It had a 42 inch touch screen. It had um, it, it of course had a refrigeration module, but it also had facial recognition software. So if I, if you walked up to the Coke machine, it would say, "Oh, Adam, you can have a Coke." If I walked up to the Coke machine, it would say, "Oh, Pete, you can have a Diet Coke." And um, but it would actually be able to tell that, and also be able to read your bone structure to know if you're a man or a woman. And then in the idle state, it would do one of two other things. One, it was a Wi-Fi hotspot. And two, it also uh, was pushed to advertising uh, because it was an indoor machine placed in malls. There were 1,500 of them sold, and they would actually sell advertising to all the stores in the mall, which, by the way, generated more revenue than selling Cokes. So you could survive on an island with a Coke machine? <laughs> yeah. Just Pretty to much. Sort of, sort of, yeah. We'd have a conversation with the machine. So, okay, so that's interesting. And now we have data that we're collecting and we're parsing all this stuff. So that's that's basically the difference, right? Is we're computing it all and you said store it forward, right? So now it's actionable data. That's what we're aiming at. Right. The data has to be actionable. But, but, but we're over, right? So in a in an IoT infrastructure, let's say a large industrial infrastructure, so let's take a manufacturing facility and or an oil and gas refining plant, right? So you could have a plant with 20, 30, 50,000 sensors. Right, and um, most of the data is sensors, small data, right? Hot, off, in, out, hot, cold, full, empty, right? Yeah. We're, we're talking about very small packet size. Um, if they're reporting every 15 seconds, 50,000 sensors reporting every 15 seconds, small packets, is a huge amount of data. Okay, so the data has to be aggregated, it has to be normalized. Um, it's typically looked at the edge, it's computed to the edge, and then at that point, it's sent up to the cloud. Now, why is that important? Well, on the edge, right, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're in Detroit, Michigan, where you can get, you know, you're getting gig E on the plant floor, great, you can send all the data you want. Okay, they have a data center in Auburn Hills, which is run by HP, um, and it works out real well. If you, however, are on an oil and gas field in the middle of a Oklahoma, and you have 20,000 sensors, and uh, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, or Timo has not built a cell tower uh, in a non-populated area to support the plant, then you're most likely taking satellite time. And satellite time is really expensive, which means you're going to be very diligent in how you send the data up to the cloud. You're not going to be sending all the data. You're going to be taking the data on the edge, manipulated, and sending the exceptions. So, okay, now we're still talking about pretty simple stuff, right? So we're talking about on-off, we're talking about full, empty, sort of just state data and just basic, basic control data. That's what we've been hearing so far. We know that more complex things are coming. Where do you see that complex what complexity? What, what's next? What's the big complexity thing that's going next? Video. The ability to sort video. The ability to send video to the cloud and then sort the data. The data ports and video are going to be massive. Okay? And the ability to go and look at the video and actually make queries based on you know, what's in the video. Timestamps, state stamps, volume. You know, um, case in point, um, this is really sad. There's a use case uh, in an uh, urban city in the United States where the police are taking the videos, the audio tracks, and they are actually listening for bullet ricochet off of the IOT. And they can dispatch the police based on the bullet ricochet within a minute. That's impressive. That's, that's an interesting use case. Now, what else? 
Um, you know, from you know, obviously, if you live in Frisco, Texas, like I do, um, all the cameras on all the light on all the traffic lights have uh, <laughs> you know cameras now to uh, to go and and and, and uh, you know you, you see if you're you know, law abiding or not. Um, you know, so that's a use case. It's smart cities. Obviously, you're going to have a lot of variables because you're going to be able to go and have the predictive elements associated to time of day, point in time scenarios that are going to dictate real time change of action based on current conditions, traffic, accident, flow, backup, time of day. That will be able to actually self autonomously manage. Um, you know the state of uh, of flow on roads and traffic, okay, and there's a lot of data associated with that. Very cool. Okay, so we've been focusing a lot on technology. So I'm gonna switch it up on you and say, okay, where where how do we make money out of this? Right, hardware has become more of a commodity than anything else. Um, data seems to be data, but nobody has really figured out how to monetize data, really, truly monetize data. Now, and I'm saying that as, as a perspective of data as itself by itself, not taking actionable data and doing something with data. So where, where do you see that all put together? Well, the first thing I'll say to that is most companies haven't figured out how to monetize data. I believe, I would argue that, that our friends at Google have done a fine job of monetizing data. Our friends at Facebook have also done the same. Okay, um, you know, the ability to go forward and look at the data that you have and to be able to make predictive business decisions based on the data and the trends that are available are how, how IoT gets monetized. You know, case in point, um, let's say uh, you have sensors on your rail system, like, you know, it's called CN Rail or BNSF. Okay, if you have sensors on all your tracks and your rail cars, you can actually run the trains faster, you can actually run them more frequently, you can run them closer together, you can monitor the speed and the conditions more accurately, and you can get higher throughput on your track. Higher throughput on your track means you, know, you can deliver more for less. Because you know, if you look at your fixed costs versus your variable costs, the cars and your track are fixed costs. Your variable costs are the amount of traffic on the uh, on the line. That's interesting. Okay, so besides actionable data, which is clearly what people haven't realized, it seems like people haven't realized yet. And there's there's probably stuff that I'm not even completely seeing. Outside of that, in the IoT space, what we know where we are. So one of the things I'm going to also get Keith to explain is that this is what's called a hype cycle. And if you guys don't know what the hype cycle is. Uh, I'll get Pete to explain the hype cycle real quickly. Okay. So uh, Gartner, which is a popular consulting firm that many of you in the room have heard of, students in the room, I don't know if you've heard of Gartner. Um, they're, they're, they're a big firm. They're like Forrester, Yankee, or um, you know, others. Uh, they actually have a trends analysis based on all the current technologies called the hype cycle. And um, you know, they, they talk about the different states of technology um, you know, with regard to public, you know, the public perception, where it is in the mind share of people, where it is from an actionable perspective, and where it is from a de de deployment perspective. So, in 2014, in all the technologies, the absolute pinnacle technology in Gartner's hype cycle um, is actually IoT. So, how a hype cycle works is that. You know, people talk about this for a long, 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 long time, and he rides to the, to the apex of the curve, and then it falls down the curve. Because people have talked about it for so long um, that they get frustrated, and then when it falls down, uh, Gardner actually has labeled that the trough of disillusionment. Okay, so you're all, all disillusioned by the, uh, by the fact that, well, we all said it's going to be big, we all said it's going to be 50 billion devices, where are they? And then at that point, then you start trending back up because the use cases of the technology meets <coughs> the expectation. And that's where you get into the pathway of productivity. Okay, so we are at the apex. We are at the top of the hype. Okay, and now that's why people are questioning, you know, show me the money. Where's the money? 
How do I get engaged? How am I going to make money? And and there have been a lot of problems why you know M to M has been really M to M has been around a long, long time, right? Typically close to the Why it has now all of a sudden come to the forefront is uh, a lot to do with Moore's law, right? You know the cost of computing has has gone down. Um, the you know ability to have computing power has gone up. Memory has capabilities have increased. Okay, the cost of sensors have dropped radically. John, would you agree with that? You're a sensor guy. Okay, so at this point, if your sensors are more powerful and they're cheaper, they last longer, okay, you can do more. And then concurrently with IoT, the other dynamics have hit as well. The cloud computing capabilities have increased, the throughput, the availability of network has increased, the ability to go forward, put together really dynamic and robust analytics engines of capability have increased and the algorithms have propagated that will make the data actionable. So we're getting to it. The problem is these technologies all exist. They're still a little spendy and there are still a lot, not enough people who know how to do it all or put all the pieces together. So that's why they're not as actionable. And there are a lot of segments. Segments all need to come together into a, a, a unique homogeneous um, you know, pervasive system. And then once you can deploy that, that's when you get real business value. Okay, so that being said, who should we look out for and what should we look out for in the business area? Who, who should we follow? Who should we learn our lessons from? What's a good lesson learned? Actually, yeah, even more so. Like, let's be specific about this. What's a good lesson learned in the IoT space? Gee, so it, it, it's very similar to what you learned in kindergarten, right? So IoT is going to be playing nice together. Everybody who plays nice together is going to win. Unlike the other technology trends that have happened throughout history, IoT is going to be very, very much predicated on how well other companies cooperate with other companies. Now that's the good news. The bad news is, is that everybody is jockeying and positioning and leveraging partners to go forward and do this. And the problem is, you know, some people are only partnering with others and then some people are partnering with everybody, but no one company is going to be able to go and say, I have a complete soup to nut system, I can put it in. People like Accenture, people like IBM, people like Samsung, people like Cisco, they all have partners. There's nobody at this point can do the entire ecosystem soup to nuts. So okay, this is my like my last question, and this kind of goes back to the technical side just because you, it, it's a natural fit for flow. Um, and then after that, I'm going to open it up to you guys and hopefully open it up to the internet as well for questions. But my last question is, is there are 10 million standards, it feels like, out there. There are, there is the LoRa Alliance, there is the N-Wave IEEE standard, there's Sixbox, there is LTE Cat Zero, LTE-M, um, there's Alliance for IoT Innovation, Open Interconnect Consortium, and I can go on for days and days and days on these All standards. All open M to M. Thread, yeah, 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 yeah. IEEE and very left. So, uh, mm -hmm. so ITIA, yeah, yeah. There are lots and lots and lots of standards. There are actually 16 M to M standard committees right now that are open, and the standards are not put together at this point. So, case in point, IEEE has announced that in the first half of 2016, they're going to issue their first formal standards letter. They haven't even done it yet. Okay, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. So, um, from a standards perspective, you know, so let's say there are two types of standards we're talking about. So, when you talk about LoRa or what N-Wave do, does, which is weightless, or you know, you're you're looking at Sigfox or you're looking at, um, you know, you know the, the LTE variants, the low power LTE, right? Um, you know, the communication standards for um, for uh, IoT are going to drive adoption and integration. Um, the reason that these um, wireless uh, technologies are coming and taking place is because they're low bandwidth, low packet type of low uh, transmissions got capabilities that will allow you to interconnect you know, tens of thousands of devices using low packets over a low over a flat bandwidth technology um, that you can deploy quickly. Case in point from a Sigfox perspective if you actually had a Sigfox enabled 
city, let's say San Francisco, you can put six radios in, which are about ten thousand dollars a piece, and light up the entire city of San Francisco to start, which is pretty inexpensive. Plus, the cost is, you know, a whole lot less than putting in an end, you know, uh, an end to end module from the carrier. Um, the other standards bodies are just, you know, how all the standards can be intercommunicated. Um, and then that is, um, should we wait for standards? And the answer is no, because the standards bodies will catch up with the common deployments that we put in. You know, case in point, um, some of the people in this room understand how long it put, took to put together uh, the IEEE 80211 uh, A, B, and G standards. Right? It took forever. And then the other standards that followed thereafter, like N, um, you know, came quickly. But what you know, hardware manufacturers did is that they took the initial iterations of the standard, they built hardware, modified them with patches and upgrades once the standards finalized. So, you know, my, my you know, comment to everybody would be, let's go, let's do, let's implement. And let's standard, a commence. That's A commence. <coughs> and uh, and uh, we will indeed, uh, everything will catch up. Okay, let's open it up to the audience. I just have a question to that point. Is there a, a low power protocol that you prefer um, over the other? Do you like Linway versus um, Aura or over Sigfox? Is there one that you think is better poised for growth and stability right now? No. No. Um, and, and now let me answer the question. So I, I don't have a preference. They all have their merits. You know, Sigfox is a private network, right? So I mean, clearly it's a, they're a carrier. They're a global carrier. Uh, they raised $150 million to start deploying. They're out of money. So they're going for another raise. Oh, they're out of money? Yeah. Uh -huh. And, uh, but look at it. You know, it's very low cost. It's very, very dynamic throughput. Uh, Weightless, which what N-Wave runs, is a very small, um, thin packet with obviously very little, you know, low, uh, you know, header, footer information. Um, the nice thing about the weightless standard is, since uh, there are no, since it's an open standard, uh, there are there are there's nobody that's going forward and, and dictating what you can do. It's really good for a private network, especially places where you're not going to have, you know, Sig, you know, Sigfox is going to do Dallas, no doubt. Sigfox is not going to do Ardmore, Oklahoma. Okay, just not. Uh, and then you know, with regard to LoRa and or LTE, you know, the LTE standards, obviously the carriers are going to want to go jump on that to maximize their networks. Um, that's great, and they'll have its point in time. And then with LoRa, again, you know, there'll be a lots, of, lots of use cases for them. So basically, you know, it's not so much about the communication standard protocol, it's what makes sense for the business value. On the network solution, uh, the LTE and right, that's what it's called. Right. The battery life on that's only like a couple of months. Am I right in that, or was I wrong? Because I thought that if you kind of compare the standards together, that one sounds great, but in practicality, like how would you, how could well, you actually make that? Well, and again, right. So that might be a problem for some use cases, and it might be no problem at all for other use cases. Yeah. So the battery life is let's say three months. You know, but you have you know it's a site that's a dead day. You, you get traffic every week, changing out batteries might not be a big problem whatsoever. You know, candidly, if you're looking at, let's say, BLE, right, for beacons, you know, they have battery issues too, the beacons, right? But beacons are coming to the price point now where you just throw the beacon away, right, as opposed to replace them. But you still have to replace them, right? Whereas, like, with weightless, you, you get some 10-year throughput on the battery, right? You know, depending. But it also depends on your traffic. It depends on the range. It depends on packet size. If you have to pack it size, you can use the battery. And it's it's not it's arithmetic, right? Make sense? Good question over here. So wait, I got a question from online. Oh, very good. Uh, what is your favorite wearable? My favorite wearable. Wow. That's yeah, so um you know the funny thing is, so I I I, I I you know I do use Jawbone, okay, as a as a, as a fitness tracker, as you can tell how fit I am. Um, but anyway, with regard to that, um, what I really like as a use case, there's a couple of use cases I really like. 
One was a soft pendant that was uh, actually developed at the uh, back of uh, the AT&T um, developer conference last year, where the pendant was used for children getting on and off school buses to track them on field trips. I thought that was really cool. Another one that I worked with for a while was working with a company that was actually uh, building an artificial pancreas. And I thought that was very cool. Yeah, and so that one actually is really cool. And, and just to kind of go in depth on that one, and I learned about this one just literally earlier this week, I think, from Pete. And it's not, not the typical 3D printed pancreas. It's not like something we've been 3D printing organs or hard, like growing our own organs or whatever it might be. This is literally doing the same function. Yeah. So how it works is it's inside. Uh, so it's the ultimate wearable, it's implantable. So you actually have to actually, you know, insert it into the body. One of the problems with type 1 type 2 diabetes is that when you measure diabetic, you know, from the insulin draw, um, you're taking skin blood. Well, that's late, right? That's, his, that's historic data, that's not real time. So if you want to effectively manage that with insulin pumps, uh, you need core blood. So the artificial pancreas, what it does, is a sensor that you actually put into one of the main blood streams that actually will, well, every 15 seconds, and this is really what you want 15 second reporting, by the way, every 15 seconds will tell you what your insulin levels are and will actually communicate to the insulin pump and more specifically and effectively dose you. And the real benefit to the uh, patient is that, uh, you know, you have better long-term sustainability, you have, uh, you know, less, less shock to the system, um, you know, that you have less side effects uh, of, uh, you know, taking insulin. And, of course, the insurance companies like it because, of course, that means a less, a less uh, chronic malady and, uh, you know, less reoccurrence and readmittance to the hospital from a chronic illness because chronic illness is the number one cause to the healthcare system today, both payers and payees. So. Okay. Other questions here? All right, go with Mola. Yeah, you're going to die. Yeah, it was a tie. Go. Um, sort of about the hype cycle, the Cardinals hype cycle. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. Some of the uh, things I've been seeing for the past couple of years with IoT. Um, just like uh, virtual reality, uh, right now we're in this big, we've got this big hype cycle with virtual reality as well. Virtual reality is in the trough of disillusionment right now. But, uh, <laughs> something more, something else. Uh, what I've been looking into is the fact that, like, uh, right now we're like the third or fourth wave of virtual reality. Uh, and so I'm like, yeah, early 80s, and uh, all these companies like Nintendo and Sony developed all this tech. I wasn't born back then, so I don't really know the whole story, but um, they created this tech and eventually released it to the market. And some of it didn't catch on because consumers found out that it was a piece of shit, like the technology wasn't there, right? And then that killed the, the, the virtual reality bubble. And then maybe 10 years later, early 90s, the same thing happened, and then maybe early 2000s, and right now. I think we're going to figure it out now. I mean, the technology seems to be there. But for IoT, it relates to the consumer, so like the smart home, and like, uh, like some stuff like the smart thermostat, the smart chair that like senses your weight, or like your posture. Like those little things, um, I'm concerned that there's going to be a, a, a similar bubble bus that's going to occur pretty soon because little elements like energy, like when you embed IT into anything, uh, what you do is you associate uh, energy, right? Like, Energy becomes a component like a chair now. It never used to be. We don't have to charge these chairs, but if you put uh, like IoT into it, put IT into it, um, you can have a battery or like maybe you can plug it into the wall. That's as far as user experience goes, as far as IoT user experience goes, that's not going to scale. Like, who aren't going to want to deal with that? So, I think that's one of the major puzzle pieces that if we don't have that figured out, like wireless energy, that's going to bust as well as the IoT bubble for consumers. Maybe. So, let me make a quick comment to, uh, to, to that statement. Um, so energy is a big problem in IoT, right? But it's not necessarily the problem that you think it is. So it's not necessarily the ability to make the energy. It's about when the energy is made. Because energy has to be consumed on demand. So case in point, there was an interesting circumstance that happened in Texas last <coughs> month. So um, we're all familiar that energy is traded on the spot market. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you know what the spot price in the middle of like last month, one night, was for electric energy in Texas? It was zero. 
hit zero. The cost of a kilowatt hour was zero. The reason for that, there was way, way, um, a huge amount of over overproduction versus consumption. Now that was in the middle of the night. So the, the issue is, how do we actually store the energy that's being created, which is, you know, it was a windy night. And by the way, Texas is the largest wind producer in the nation. Um, so how do you store that energy so you can effectively use that energy, um, you know, and, and normalize it based on people's user habits? So I think that's going to be, I mean, that will be the issue with regard to energy and IoT. Getting to your virtual reality. Um, so virtual reality is still in the trough of disillusionment because you're in the third wave of virtual reality right now. And the big problem with virtual reality is latency. There are a lot of you know, technologies that are tolerant of latency. Um, virtual reality is the least tolerant of to latency of all technologies because if you've actually used a VR system and you actually have like jitter, and I don't know if you've ever seen jitter on VR, um, people actually get physically ill, okay, because they can't, because, you know, the virtual reality is very good now, right, and the problem is that you just can't take the jitter, um, so people, you know, there are huge problems, and they'll get solved, but, you know, it has to do with throughput, network, connectivity, and, oh, by the way, the data speeds are, are ex 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 exceptionally high, good news is, is that you know, throughput's going to increase. As a matter of fact, I just saw, I forget which company, I think it was Ericsson, just announced, or maybe it was at AL, just announced that you're going to have petabit networks coming out uh, shortly, terrestrial petabit. So, it's like, what, what's what, uh, what's after OZ 760? I don't know, it's like 14, 26,074, or whatever. <laughs> so, it, it's going to be, it's going to be really stinking fast, and you're going to need it for virtual reality. Augmented reality, however, has a really high upside. Virtual reality is still problematic. Roman. Um, so where do you see the uh, best opportunities uh, in terms of the IoT affecting the industries, businesses? Uh, anything sticks out um, in, uh, from where you sit? Yes. So I think there are tremendous point opportunities in IoT. You know, the big, you know, so people get fascinated with IoT and things. And I think the real success in flash points are going to be point solutions. Okay, so find a problem that's worth solving, solve the problem. And then, and, and you know, rinse, lather, repeat. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really that simple. Find a problem worth solving, solve the problem with IoT. Do it again, and then you know build on the use cases. So from a concentric circle type, type standpoint, right? You know, build a use case, go into a similar use case, build on that, build on that, and then you know enhance, you know, increase the complexity and the level of it, integration. Does that make sense? Okay. So one last question, and I think then we'll start. Wrapping it up tonight because I don't know. I think are we running out of time, Pete? No, we're not. Oh wow, we have lots of time. Wow. Okay. Um, never mind then. So keep going because I've got a couple more questions too. Yeah, so uh, my question was, me as a consumer, you know, what is what does it mean in terms of privacy? Am I giving up entire privacy just to make IoT flourish for the future? Ooh, that's because that's the question I'd like to be asked. Whether it's Google Nest, whether it's a smart car, whether it's a, you know the next tier measurement for diabetes from Google or Facebook, or you know, it seems like everybody. I mean, the companies have access to data. You have to agree to their privacy laws or whatever usage agreements, terms and yeah, terms and conditions to use their devices. So eventually, it looks like as a consumer, I'm yeah, I'm gaining better technologies, but it looks like nothing is going to be private anymore. So you know. Privacy and security are really big issues in IoT. Really big issues. I was coaching somebody uh, here earlier before we started when uh, you know I felt like you know I, I the uh, the father in the movie The Graduate when he said you know he looked at the he looked at uh, young Dustin Hoffman and said 
plastics. Yeah. So, um, so with, re with regard to that, you know, I, I said to that person, you know, data science. Okay, so data science and security privacy are going to be the two major elements. Um, you know, we started talking about the cloud. We also started talking about edge computing. Security privacy is going to have to live in the edge because the problem with sensors, okay, if you've ever designed or made a sensor, you realize that the amount of RAM in a sensor is not going to be able to support putting in, you know, AS two fifty six bit encryption. Okay, um, I mean, candidly, you know, sensors, sophisticated sensors, are using embedded Linux, embedded Windows, QNX, um, you know, some sort of, you know, maybe a, a WebOS, which, by the way, LG still makes. Uh, they own WebOS now, or or some sort of, uh, you know, um, you know small, lightweight OS, but more and more often than not, most of the sensors on the marketplace just have a firmware layer that runs the sensor. There's no place to put the security. So what you're going to have to do is aggregate all the sensor data into a gateway or a secure edge and do the, uh, do the encryption, do the security algorithms there. From a privacy standpoint, you know, that's going to be a lot of the design. Uh, so the answer is yeah, that's something to be very cognizant of, uh, the security and the privacy, because quite candidly, just like the good, the good guys know where you are, the bad guys will know where you are too. Well, not only that, but we're also talking about lots and lots of data. So we're not exactly anonymizing that data right now either. No, I, well, I mean, today it's, you know, somebody asked me the other day, he said, are you scared about, you know, you know your personal information getting hacked? And I said, no. And they go, why not? I said, because every bit of personal information in every person in America <coughs> is available on the dark web. So your social security is already out there. So, I mean, what you can do is protect how you interact from here on in. But a lot, you know, a lot of the information, you know, that you have is, you know, you can get hacked. I mean, I, I'm personally exceptionally diligent when it comes to, you know, financial security yet. Uh, I got a really interesting call the other day from my accountant when I filed my my tax return, which I took out of the extension and I filed it late. I, I was, you know, legal and everything because of the extension. And we tried to electronically file it and it was rejected because it was already filed. So somebody had actually filed taxes in my name. So I actually had to go to the IRS and say, uh, no, 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 because what they were trying, they were falsely, uh, you know, putting out my financial information to get the, you know, the, the, the tax credit to get a check from the IRS. And, you know, I, I'm as secure as you can get. I mean, I actually use a separate PC on an Ethernet connection on a computer that I don't ever surf the web. It's the only one that accesses my financial transactions, like what they tell you to do with me, all the security books. And I still got to hacked that way. So, okay, we're talking about security and some other things. This market is all fine and fast. What is your favorite vertical in the IoT space to get into and pick one? Because I know there's lots of horizontals and vertical kind of all over the place, right? So, and they all overlap. Smart buildings. That's actually a horizontal. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. Wait, but yeah, there, there, is there even a, a single vertical, or is it all kind of horizontal right now? Well, so smart buildings are horizontal, right? Um, you know, oil and gas is a vertical. Well, healthcare is a vertical. Well, no, are, are, are we sure about that though? Oil and gas. Well, so like all like all use cases, there are vertical there are vertical use cases with horizontal exposures. So everybody. Every IoT industry has a smart building element to it, you know. Um, but there are in industry specific. I think, for a humanity perspective, healthcare. So, your final answer is healthcare, not smart buildings. Healthcare, because smart buildings are ours all. Fair, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and okay, so this is another one of those. Uh, this was a question that I don't know. I know it's online, it's also popped up, but then also something we were talking about earlier. 
we're at, the, we're at the very pinnacle of the hype cycle right now, right? And yet, we're still running into people on a regular basis who are not realizing they can they can use and leverage IoT to solve a lot of their problems. So, how come there's such a, a giant gap? Right? Why is there a gap between the education of these people who could use it and desperately these, these verticals could use it? And also at the same time, we're at this pinnacle of everybody's talking about it. Um, and there's there's even this great stat. So all four major consultancies, Accenture, um, KPMG, and all these guys, within 24 hours, all changed all major airport signs to say they could all handle like IoT, which is kind of nutty if you think about it. Like, holy crap, these guys all changed their signs in the airport within 24 hours to say we can handle IoT. So we're we're clearly in that cognizant space of we can handle this. But yet, there are droves of folks out there who are roaming around going, wait, sensors can do that? So sensors have been around for 20 years, OK? Um, the vast capabilities that are available now have not. But sensor technology has been around for 20 years or more. Um, I, I like it to this. So I, I used to work for Accenture, personally. I ran their uh, go to market for the Americas and the mobile practice. And um, as well as running all their strategic alliances in mobile. And, you know, this is 2006, 2007. So uh, I did a keynote speech one year for Sybase, where we talked about how enterprise mobility was about to take off, um, you know, and people were about to leverage this. And this was in 2007. So here we are eight years later, and in the realm of enterprise mobility, most Enterprises have not yet fully deployed an enterprise-first strategy in, in their in their mobile implementations. Okay, and, and enterprise mobility has been a more robust and dynamic topic for a much longer and, and variable time. And, and, and you know, in, in enterprise mobility was all about five Ps, right? You know, for me it was about pixels, processor, um, you know, pipe, power, and price. So if those five, you know, align for your business, you got into it. Well, if you look at, you know, smartphones today, you know, the pictures, pixels are good. You know, 4 is pretty nice. You know, power, well, you know, we all have battery issues, but, you know, you can solve that. But, you know, you have 3,000 million batteries in most of these things now. You know, the price, you know, they're all subsidized. So, and, and, you know, pervasive networks, they're all good. So people adopt enterprise mobility now. Um, Ten years from now, We'll be sitting in a room, and there will be companies who are like saying, "You can do that with sensors." And uh, but the difference is, the vast majority of companies will have some sort of an adoption schema. The big difference for IoT, though, as opposed to any other technology, is I think the real adoption is not going to be with IT. The real adoption is going to be with the line of business folk, right? Because at the end of the day, it's how does this drive value to the business? How does this bring in revenue? How does this cut cost? And how does this manage compliance? Okay, so then you brought up IT, right? And there's an IT versus OT integration. What what does that mean? First of all, and then second of all, how like what's what's driving? Okay. So that's a great question. So um, how many people in here have ever heard of OT? Just raise right hands. Two. Okay. So, um, sensor networks have been around for a very, very long time in the industry. Manufacturing, utility, power. Right? Um, so, operational technology systems <coughs> and command and control systems that have been integrated by companies like Rockwell, Schneider, Siemens, Emerson, Honeywell, you know, to, to manage, you know, the plant, to manage the production line. Um, these networks have been driven uh, using SCADA networking, okay, where they've been closed loop systems to proprietary input and output that have not gone to private data stores, not gone to open networks, not gone to control, you know, not have had, you know, have a, a proprietary uh, integration uh, networks. You know, and they have their own names, right? So uh, I know that uh, the Schneider's system is called Wonderware, okay, as an example. I mean, I don't know. Anybody ever heard of Wonderware? That's Schneider's, you know, mantra, right? 
they are now integrating the closed loop systems with the open loop systems. The problem is that the open loop systems, the closed loop systems, don't have the ability to go forward and uh, you know potentially you know integrate to the new command and control systems because uh, all you know most new sensor networks um, have the ability to uh, integrate to IPv6 and the old legacy systems do not. Uh, and secondly, there's always a uh, there, there, there's a problem with the operational technology systems. And there's there's a great amount of fear that if you open up the networks to the cloud to um, the network as a whole, is that you run the security risk, right? So we can we can live with someone hacking Target. Okay, we're not happy. You know, CEO gets fired, but we can live with that. We can't live with people hacking. can't live with people, you know, hacking an oil plant. Well, we can't. We just hack their own. What? <laughs> well, so <laughs> we, you, we can have a separate conversation about, you know, governmental hacking, you know, and, you know, the, you know like the NSA defensive and the NFA offensive sides of the house, right? I mean, there, there's cyber war going on right now. You know, every nation is hacking. And the OPM was just recently hacked. Right, the White House was hacked. The uh, Department, the Army was hacked. I mean, yeah. you know, we're, and uh, you know, Russia and China are being hacked all the time. I mean, Anonymous just hacked the ISIS, right? So, I mean, everybody's hacking everybody. So, but, you know, nuclear plants, you know, you know, yeah, those systems have been closed loop for a long, long time for a reason. And the question is, do you, how do you derive the value you get from, you know, IoT, uh, you know, in classic closed scale, scale to end to end control systems? And, and that's a big question. Yeah. So, do you think uh, there's a bigger opportunity in the industrial IoT space rather than currently the focus here is more on the consumer IoT side? That, that's a great question. So the so most of the experts believe that consumer IoT will lead the day until 2017, 2018. And then from the 2018 standpoint on, industrial IoT will outpace consumer IoT two and three times to one. Because you know the sheer deployment of the number of sensors that you can deploy in a in an industrial element. Is, is you know vastly outpaces. So if you take there are 300 million Americans, okay, and let's say we're going to place, not including their cell phones, six sensors on each one. You know you're only talking about one point what eight you know eight billion sensors. You know you can, you can put a whole lot in every plant. Industrial IoT will absolutely rule the day, but not for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, back to the hype cycles. Um, you're saying today's 2015, we're at the top of the hype cycle for IoT. Um, at least that's my your size. Keep in mind this has changed four times in the last year. Okay. It's gone back and forth a ton. Okay. Um, where do you think the, the, the top of the hype cycle was for mobile? Um, what year? Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, um, so, so mobile was probably 2010, um, it hit the top of the hype cycle, and then it hit the trough of disillusionment, and now we're actually seeing, it in, you know, the pathways of progress, right? So people are now, you know, getting serious about mobile first uh, enterprises. Um, you know, I, I'll give you a funny story about Gardner. So, um, so I used to be the U.S. General Manager of Enterprise Mobility at Samsung. So, um, and I also ran MDEM at Samsung. And I went to a Gardner conference in 2009, and the Gardner analyst got there and said, well, this is what we see in enterprise mobility. We still believe, this is 2009 now, because we see that BlackBerry and um, Palm Symbian 
and Windows Mobile will rule the day in the enterprise. We don't see that Apple at all is an enterprise-focused company, okay? And uh, we don't at all see that Samsung is uh, serious about enterprise mobility in the least. Now, of course, I'm here to talk about enterprise mobility. I just wrote Samsung Global Enterprise Strategy, so I took a little bit of umbrage to that statement. Um, needless to say, they got every single one of those points wrong. Every one. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, right? Is is since we are so high, high, how do we educate the right players? How do we go about educating the right players? So, I think Albert Einstein put it best, right? The, you know, the market an expert is taking a complex term or, or a premise and explaining it in such a way that a layman can understand it, right? So you actually have to go forward and, and drill down and make sure everybody gets the why. Not so much the how, but the why. So the story I always, I, you know, whenever I speak at a conference, um, I always use this as if I'm explaining IoT. Think of it this way. You leave your house, or you, you leave your office. It's 5 o'clock. You walk to the door. The door knows that you're coming. It senses you because of your presence. It opens. It allows you to go into the elevator, which is normally locked, but it knows it's you, and it knows that your car is on P1 of the parking garage. So it allows you to go down to P1 and it allows you to walk to your car. So you go to your car, your car sees you coming, cameras in your car look around to see if there's anybody there. From a security perspective, it opens up, you get in the back of the car because you're not driving it anymore. You get in the car, you start doing work, you tell, you say, go pick, pick up your wife. So it goes to your wife's office, okay? And uh, you know, with all my good drives, you meet her. And it looks around to see if it's safe for her to get in the car. She gets in the car and you say, okay, let's go home. Okay, it senses the traffic. It wraps the right route because it's communicating to the cars and the traffic systems. And then you go home. Now, your car is communicating to your home saying that you're on the way. So you have a roast in the uh, refrigerator oven, right? Because your oven works as both a refrigerator and an oven. So you pre-populated the roast in the oven, so now it automatically starts heating up. So when you get home, there's going to be dinner. So you get to your house, okay, the dinner's in the oven, and it had changed it because it was a little delay. The house looks at the car and looks all around to see it's safe to open the garage. It opens the garage, you go inside, you know, you close the garage, and it knows it's Friday night and it's day night, right? So you walk in the car, the two of you come out of the car, you walk in the house, and your LED lighting changes to mood lighting, and the very white music comes on, <laughs> right? Because it knows that it's state night, right? And it sets the entire mood, okay? That's what IoT is going to do. Does that make sense? That, and that's just on one side of the thing, right? That's, that's just not the consumer option. Right? That's not going back to the good app point, which is there's the industrial side of things. Right. So, I mean, but that being said, you have to be real careful. So, uh, Corey Egan, who's an IoT founder here in Dallas, who runs I knew, although me, we were at a, uh, a speaking session, and we were talking about the security of the lights. And I was asking Corey about his security, and somebody said, you know, just blurted out, why do you need security on LED lighting? I don't understand. And I said, well, it's really simple. You can control the lights from your iPhone. Is that correct? Yeah. It means you can also hack the lights. So if you hack the lights, you can take control of the lights, change the password, and then pray, and then pop the home invasion. Shut the lights off, go in infrared, and you know completely cripple the uh, the residents. So you're gonna have to be real careful about that too. Security, we can give a good example. Uh, it was in it was in the news uh, where remotely uh, Jeep Cherokee was hacked when a, a person was driving. So the remotely the person who overhacked it, it was a it was a trial. I mean, it was all planned, but that scientist was able to hack it, was able to control it, steer it, change the gear, apply the brakes, and the driver sitting couldn't do anything. Yeah. So, so <coughs> really cool, really scary. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> 
it kind of, when you're talking about, you know, them stealing your personal identity, I actually figured out, well, first I thought someone stole my identity, but later after investigating, they somehow mixed up the data records, like somebody's using my address. So, you know, I get a lot of weird stuff from that. So with all the government could never do that. Yeah, well, they said they bought it from some data company. They buy their data. When I questioned UPS, I was actually trying to get some a UPS application working. And it wouldn't let me because I somebody else owned my address in their database. So my point is, with all this proliferation of data, don't you think that's going to be, you know, a lot more things that can go wrong, a lot more data mistakes? Because, you know, they tell you you should check your credit, which, of course, I never did until I was trying to refinance one of my houses or get rid of a rent house. Then I had to check it. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of wrong data on our credit reporting. And, you know, you do have to clear it up. So, you know, isn't there going to be, like, in my case, it could be more headaches. So I think I said this earlier. The two fields that if you were a, right. a, a, young, a young child coming in college, mm -hmm. I can say that. I had, had my young child just graduated college. <laughs> um, data science is secure. Yeah. Data science is, is going to be paramount. Because even now, I don't know how to fix all the data mistakes. I just gave up on that UPS one, and, you know, who knows? Yeah. On that scary note, <laughs> uh, I say, you know, you got more questions, come up, find us. Uh, Pete, where can they find you online at all? Uh, so, my email address is pdenaki at acommence.com. By the way, acommence. Uh, is, a, is, of course, an invented name. Um, the word commence means to start. The, the letter A represents acceleration. And the value proposition of our business is we help companies accelerate their start. Whether you're an existing company, like some of our clients, we have an LG and Kia Sarah as clients, or if you're a startup company with a great value proposition, we help you get going. That's what we do. Yes, be kind. For young startup professionals who want to get into the space, what would you advise them? Ah, uh, that's a great question. So the question is, for young startup professionals who want to get into the space, um, I would advise them several things. One, learn all of the elements of the technology, right? You know, um, there is a technology life cycle from sensor to the network to the platform to the management of the sensors to the aggregation of data, the security, the sending the data to the cloud to the access of the virtualization to visualization to the real-time management of the data to the what-if scenario business process workflow engine point. So learn the entire ecosystem and then pick a place to jump in because you can't be expert at all of it. So it's hard to be expert at one. So just pick, pick your passion, go from there, jump into your value chain, and then, uh, you know, enter. Because, you know, it's uh, 35 years ago when I started this, uh, people always said, oh, it's so cool you're in telecom. What a great non new dynamic field. This is awesome. We're changing out all these cord boards and stepper switches and uh, putting in PBXs, right? And routers. And this internet thing is going to be big. Um, 35 years later, people go say, oh man, you're so lucky. You're in communications and mobile and IoT. This is great. This is going to be the next cool thing. Well, I'll tell you something. It's been the next cool thing for 35 straight years. And I guarantee you, it's going to be the next cool thing for the next 35 years. Cool. So on that note, come find us, and we will see you at the next meetup. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, do you have a giveaway? Oh, I have a giveaway. I do. So five years ago, I was, uh, I, I was, and I'm going to make this decision myself, right? So, um. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to work on a collaboration book called Managing the Mobile Workforce. And it's a book about how people manage 
uh, mobile employees. It's actually a graduate level business book. Um, it was done by uh, two gentlemen, uh, Dan Clemens and Michael Crawl. However, they used 30 business and IT leaders to go and collaborate on the book. So um, several of the people who worked on the book were very powerful. The senior vice president of HP, um, the uh, CEO of Deloitte, worked on the book with us. Um, I was the principal technologist at Mobile, which is why they asked me to be there. And I get to work on a book with a guy named Stephen Covey, oh, yeah. if you've ever heard of him. So um, I wrote the platform section of the book. So and uh, so I'm going to give the book to the person who I think did the best job of asking good, hard, impactful questions. So and I think so. And this is completely 